to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast. Our uh, text today for Epiphany 2 will be from 1 Samuel chapter 3. The verses we'll be dealing with are the first 10 verses. We're not going to do all 20 that are uh, a possibility. You may want to include that yourself, but we really don't have the, uh, the space time to do all of it. So these um, first 10 verses really are detailing for us the call of Samuel, and you'll notice a correlation with the gospel text from uh, John chapter 1, uh, beginning at the 43rd verse, where we also have these um, call accounts for, uh, for Philip and for Nathaniel. Now, it's kind of interesting, the similarities, but first of all, in this, uh, this call of Samuel, you get a lot of detail, probably uh, certainly one of the most detailed call accounts uh, for prophets in, in the Old Testament. Uh, and some people would even say it's not a call account, it's a sending account, but uh, whatever language you choose to use, uh, that's we see the correlation then with the John 1 text here. Both the Old Testament and the Gospel lessons then have this strong epiphany flavor as the, uh, as the word of the Lord is revealed to Samuel and then Philip and Nathaniel recognize Jesus, the Messiah, the word incarnate. So you see this kind of revelation, this manifestation and epiphany uh, of such. And these are the reason why these texts were chosen for uh, epiphany season. Another thing we want to look at uh, before we look at the nuances in the text itself, it, it's important to remember, in fact, I think very helpful to remember the context, what's going on here at this point in, in Samuel's life or in the book of the first book of Samuel. Uh, it begins, this narrative, it begins uh, with, with Samuel's birth narrative. You know, remember his mother, Hannah, who uh, provides one of those beautiful, um, I don't know what you would, what would we call it, one of those beautiful poetry prose sections, like a psalm almost, but certainly a, a song, uh, because the Lord has heard her prayers and because she's a, a woman who was barren. And this whole barren womb motif is very powerful in Samuel. And if we want to remember that, um, what that motif is all about, it plays into this a little bit. You know, uh, Hannah, the Lord remembers her, the zakar, the remembering of her, hears her cry, remembers her, and then he, he opens her womb. The Lord God himself opens, opens her womb and provides a child. Now, we see this as it develops then um, that... And again, there's two, fo there's two focuses on the barren womb, if I might digress here a little bit. A barren womb in Scripture is either found in the Messianic line, and basically the problem with the barren womb then is no baby, no Jesus, or the barren womb is in, uh, well, let's say the, the fruit of the barren womb, in this case Samuel, because he's not his Elkanah, or excuse me, um, Elkanah, right, and, her, and uh, his wife Hannah, they, um, they're not from the tribe of, of Judah, so they're not in the direct messianic line. However, this other aspect of the barren womb is that the child who's born from the barren womb, that child is, is very instrumental in preserving, protecting the uh, messianic line. An example, of course, would be like the barren womb of Rachel, and God opens Rachel's womb, and, and Joseph is born. And Joseph, of course, is the one who, who saves the people from starvation, from famine, by feeding them in Genesis. So here, though, we have Samuel, who will be born from this barren womb. And Samuel will have a big thing to play, a big part to play as well, because Samuel is, uh, is the one who the Lord God uses to anoint his first two kings and especially, and most important, the king from the tribe of Judah, the King David. And King David, of course, is a huge Messianic figure in the Messianic line, and so, so uh, or, uh, excuse me, Samuel is very instrumental 
in preserving and bringing forth the Messianic line. And so the barren womb here, you see that happening. Uh, those in the Messianic line like Sarah, Rebecca, and then those who aren't in the Messianic line, and yet their fruit of their womb becomes very important, like um, uh, Rachel, Hannah, and uh, we could say also the wife of Manoah. We never get her whole name, but the wife of Manoah whose child is uh, Samson. So all these barren wombs find their fulfillment, of course, then, in the ultimate barren womb in Scripture, the barren womb, the virgin whose womb is opened by God himself, and the Messiah then is delivered unto us. So in the barren womb, you pick up on that, that very important, uh, if you will, uh, fulfillment of the barren womb is really Christ, uh, the virgin womb. So as we, as we think then on that aspect of what precedes the text immediately, then we, then we look forward here to... Um, who Samuel is. Samuel ends up being a very important bridge figure in Scripture. He's uh, kind of the figure between the judges and the beginning of the United Monarchy. As we mentioned, he anoints the first two kings of that United, uh, United Monarchy. Uh, but in Scripture, Samuel is usually considered to have three main roles. He's obviously a, uh, a judge. Then he's also a priest, and he is a prophet. So he's a huge figure in Scripture. Now, contextually, so we say the call of Samuel lies after his birth narrative, and, his strong, and then a strong description and, and condemnation of Eli's sons, who are uh, Hophni and Phinehas, who are very unfaithful, who are doing ungodly things, actually in the temple itself, and really... Uh, in many ways, you pick up then this, this reality that God is also has some condemnation against Eli, the high priest himself, uh, because Eli obviously is not monitoring his sons very well, for lack of a, a better way of putting it, and uh, Eli will also receive uh, a kind of judgment as a result, as do his sons. So... Um, and, and then what the text does is it uses that unfaithfulness of the sons of Eli and maybe even Eli himself uh, as far as his lack of attentiveness as kind of the uh, counterpart to the faithfulness of Samuel, how Samuel was the, exact, was the opposite of all of this. And so they use that as kind of the way to show you how faithful Samuel really is. Uh, also, an important thing, though, to remember as we go through here, and we'll bump into this in the text itself, uh, what we're talking about, but uh, after this text is um, the account of the capture of the ark, which leads, of course, to the death of Eli himself, but the capture of the ark by the Philistines. Uh, that follows this, and... and uh, then the, the people wanting a king. For the first time, they want a king like the other nations. And so that, of course, as we, we know, becomes a problem. And they get the king they want. And it turns out to be the king after their hearts, who is Saul. And eventually, of course, we know that when that fails, God has Samuel anoint a king after his own heart. And that would be David. So all of this is taking place. It's a very important historical time here and a lot of transitioning happening in these uh, historically in the eras and stuff that's going on. Uh, time, Timeline-wise, uh, we would probably put what's going on here about 10, 1075 uh, B.C. and following that. So if, if you're looking for kind of a, a timeline here... And then I'd also like to point out that some of these insights I've been, I've been helped out with in this uh, from Andrew Steinman's commentary in 1 Samuel from the Concordia Commentary series. It's very helpful. So let's take a look at the text itself. First, I would want to point out that rather than one, two, and three numbering system in our text, you will note that uh, we use the old the way the Hebrew uh, Hebrews did it. 
Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Bav, Zion, Chet, etc. And that's one, two, three, four, etc. So just so you, you're aware of that as you look at the text on, on the screen here. So we begin with this uh, very first part in verse 1, the Wahana R. Uh, usually, it's a reference to um, a young man or even a boy, uh, and sometimes, yeah, a young boy even. But in this context, I think I would lean to, this is our word right here. Oops, let's see if I can do that. And that's, that is from the root, the R. And I think here in this case, I would, um, I would take na'ar in one of its uh, other senses, and that would be uh, as an apprentice. You see this, I, I think you, you'll see this in Genesis 37, when Joseph is um, helping out or learning the sheep herding trade, uh, shepherding from his brothers, uh, well, his half-brothers, obviously, the um, sons of Bil Bilhan Zilpha. They, um, they talk about him being a Na'ar, but he's 17 years old. Well, he's an apprentice. And I think you see the same thing here. And in the context, you'll notice in the text, the context is that, that Samuel is serving in the temple as uh, an assistant almost to, to Eli and learning uh, the trade, if you will, of being a priest. So he is more of an apprentice here. So I would kind of lean toward that kind of understanding of Na'ar in this particular verse. I think that's a, an important thing to take a look at. Then as we um, go further here, we have uh, the Mashareth, this word here. Now, the, um, the root here is sh Sharath, and it, this is a PL form. And uh, you see it in kind of in a meaning to, um, to serve or to minister. So um, this is what, uh, this is why I kind of lean toward the apprentice thing. This, you see that, that Samuel's a young man, but he's learning to serve, he's serving, he's ministering under the auspices of Eli. So that idea of an apprentice. I think that all fits together very well. And then we see these words, the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord, Yahweh here. Um, the, let me see up here if I can find it. Ah, yes. The Uddhavar Adonai or the Uddhavar Yahweh, the word of the Lord. It's kind of interesting. Then we move on, though, to to this word, which is um, the, the, the noun for something that is um, valuable, something that is um, rare or scarce. And notice it's connected now to the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was, your hayah here, was scarce. It was rare in those days. Uh, there's, there's some thoughts about that. I mean, why would that be um, that it was, it's defined as being rare and unusual uh, for the word of the Lord to be heard in those days? Well, I think as we go through, we can make an argument, and we'll point out some other things here, that the reason is apparently that Eli isn't really with the program, if I might say. He, he actually doesn't hear the word of the Lord when it's spoken, or he doesn't recognize it even when, when Samuel comes running back and forth. Hey, the, I heard this voice. I thought it was you. And it takes Eli three times before it finally dawns on him what's going on. Uh, and perhaps that's part of the problem that, that Eli just doesn't quite get it, that he is in his uh, unfaithfulness in his office, at least in the terms of how he allows his sons to carry on, uh, that he just doesn't hear. He just doesn't recognize the word of the Lord. So all of this kind of plays together as we begin, that rareness of the word of the Lord. And understand the word of the Lord. Now, this is, uh, 
this is a powerful thing when you consider the word of the Lord always uh, is, uh, what do we say, performative. It acts out. It, it does things. The word of the Lord is powerful, you know, as we say in the New Testament as well, accomplishing things, doing things. And so for that to be rare, it's, it's just not a great, that's not a, it's actually a sad verse in many ways that the word of the Lord is rare in those days. It's like that verse in the uh, later in the uh, Second Temple times, uh, and no prophetic voice was heard. You know, as we talk about the beginning of that 400 years before Christ, no prophetic word. Now, obviously, they have written word, but it's very, very um, concerning, maybe gut-wrenching to read something like that. No prophetic word. Well, here the word of the Lord is rare. And uh, the idea of the, um, um, the vision uh, that we have here, the, the uh, chazoth, yeah, right here at the end, the chazoth, the vision. And, and understand this is in the sense of prophetic vision, the, the idea here is uh, um, God's divine word comes through prophetic vision. So, and I believe that's how Steinman would put it, that the um, divine revelation by means of a prophetic vision is what, what we're talking about here. It's rare. And then we have the, the, uh, the uh, nifrats here, last verse, or last uh, verb. This is a nifel form coming from parats, uh, meaning to, to spread or to spread around, to spread abroad that kind of language. Now, going on to verse 2, the bait here, we go on to verse 2, then we have in your text, and it's not up here on the board on this particular text, but in your Stukartensi, as you know, the Kere and the Kethib uh, marks, the Q and the K in there. Uh, for those of you who need a little refresher, you know, the, the, it means what was said, the Kere, and then the kethib is what was written. And so the difference here in the text, the textual difference here is, is just a matter of uh, number. In the uh, what is, uh, the kere is plural, his eyes. Uh, if I can find it here. Yeah, okay. Right here. One says his eyes, and then the, the kethib. What's actually written, as you see here, is his eye. So it's just a, a difference of uh, number in this. Not, not too significant. You can kind of understand how that might have happened. And we have the word here uh, being dim. And, and if we go back to what we were saying, saying per, previously, the, the kehov uh, from ke, 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 keha, Excuse me. The idea that Eli's eyes were dim, well, while we'll know, why we do note later uh, that he was indeed, uh, I guess you would say his eyes were fixed, I think is another place that's later on uh, when the ark is captured in, in Eli, it talks about him being old, heavy, and blind, basically. But his eyes being dim here, it does beg the question after verse 1. Is it like a double meaning here for us? Not only is he hard of seeing, but he also can't see what God is doing. That he he just doesn't he just doesn't uh, get it. Um, is it both end? I know that uh, Dr. Steinman makes an observation upon that. Uh, you know the dimming of the eyes in regards to physical sight. But he also may have been dull to perceive divine revelation. I, I think that's a very uh, reasonable thing to con consider. Um, again, going back to the rareness, you know, the rareness of God's word up here, you know, that, uh, that kind of, I think, indicates that's a very big possibility. So, um, so we see the, the, uh, dim, the dimness there put together with an um, infinitive construct. You know, to be able, the yakal up there. Let's see if I can 
find it for you from here. It's in the um, that construct form with a Lamed. There it is right at the, nope, that's not it. Anyway, up this idea though to be able to um, to be able to see, our uh, his eyes are dim, uh, being um, able to see or unable to see in this case the negative. Um, going to verse three then, down here, verse three, I think we need to deal immediately with this. And again, we started talking about this in the context earlier, but this. The word here, the noun with the uh, preposition b on it, it's, it's in construct, but it's in the temple. Now, why is that significant? Well, historically speaking, there is no temple as we usually call, um, as we usually think of temple. The Jerusalem temple has not yet been built. We know that was constructed by Solomon, and we haven't even got to Saul. So what does that mean? Well, Samuel does this a couple of places, only done about three times and I think Samuel does all three, but the idea that um, the temple is actually a reference here to the tabernacle. Uh, and they're still apparently using the ark in the same way they did as they were wandering through the wilderness. And even though the, the tabernacle is set in one spot, in the next verses uh, following this chapter, we run into the fact the ark gets captured by the Philistines because obviously they're still carrying the ark into battle first, as they did throughout the wilderness wanderings and also through uh, when they were um, displacing or, or pushing out the other nations from Cana. Every battle, the ark goes in, into battle first with the priests and uh, those playing instruments. I call it the Ark of the Covenant and the praise band, but they go out into battle first. Well, they're still doing it here. And as a result, though, the ark gets captured. And that becomes, uh, by the Philistines, that's obviously a big deal. But don't think that things are kind of, this an anachronistic type of thing. The temple, Jerusalem temple has been built, but the tabernacle is referred to as a temple a couple of times by Samuel in different spots. In fact, one of them is in 2 Samuel 22, if you're looking there, and, and then also in 1 Samuel before this, in verse chapter 1, verse, verse 9. Uh, and so we see that, that Samuel here is apparently helping out Eli, who's not really physically able, whether blindness or size or age, whatever it might be, he's not physical, physically able to keep the lamp of the Lord burning in the holy place. And that's an eternal light, so it has to burn all the time. And Eli isn't apparently capable of doing it, but that's where Samuel is at when he hears, hears the voice of the Lord. He's in the holy place, not the holy of holies. We know that only the, only the high priest can go in there on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, once a year. But in this case now, this is where Samuel's sleeping in the holy place area where the eternal light, the lamp of the Lord is burning. And it mentions it hasn't yet gone out. So uh, he's doing his job well. And this is where the Lord literally, I mean, you could kind of draw the picture since the uh, Holy of Holies is the uh, dwelling place of God on earth with his people, that God has actually come out of the Holy of Holies into the holy place to talk to or to approach Samuel. And that's the calling then that we, that we pick up in these next verses. Um, as we go then on to um, verse 4 here on the Dalit, And the Lord called to Samuel, and he said, Hinene, Hinene, excuse me, Hinene, here I am, or behold me. And he, go, of course, he ends up uh, thinking that this is Eli calling to him. It's just kind of an, uh, this happens a couple times, obviously, we know that. But if we move on to verse 6 then and, and talk through this a little bit more, we'll come back to some of these other, word, uh, other uh, phrases here and pull it all together. But we have the... Um, the, uh, where's that here? Oh, yes. We have this. 
the I, um, the root here for uh, is Yasav. Yasav. If I can actually write something here very well. Yasav meaning to gather, uh, to repeat, to add, again, to increase. To the um, the root here. This is actually a hifel, so you can pick up a little bit of a causative sense to it as well. And then we um, run into the root uh, or the kara, the calling, right, right here. And that, the kara itself, is an infinitive construct. So, so we have the calling to Samuel or unto Samuel, if you like. And Samuel rose up, and then he, he ran into to Eli to say, you called me, what, what, what do you want? And Eli said, oh, I didn't call you. Go lay down. And this happened, and finally, as we said before, finally, after the third time, Eli finally thinks, you know, I, I wonder if the Lord's talking to him. Now, he's in the holy place. When all this is happening, Eli knows there's no way that he could possibly be calling to him. This probably should have dawned on him a little sooner. So again, it brings back that point we made at the beginning that perhaps the dimness here of Eli's eyes is not just physical. It might also be spiritual. He's got some issues that we've seen before this text takes place, and we'll see them after, especially as... We continue to hear the description of how his, his sons get killed when the ark is captured, and he falls over and, and breaks his neck uh, after that. And uh, the Lord carries out that, which he will tell Samuel about, but he also tells another prophet about this before Samuel. So Samuel's not the first time that Eli gets those words in in verses 11 through 20, which we won't get through all that. But just so you know, there's another prophet who actually delivers a worse message or a more detailed message about how God is not happy with Eli and his sons. And now uh, Samuel's going to reiterate that. So it won't be the first time that, Sam, uh, that uh, Eli has heard this message. It's, apparently, though, it wasn't enough times, perhaps. So then we come to this uh, da, 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 ver little word here. Yeah, I think this is it. Yep. This terem, meaning, meaning uh, not yet. And we see this twice. And I think this is a very important point that, I, that we don't want to misunderstand what's going on here in this particular part of the text. When it says that Samuel had not yet heard, had not yet, uh, did not yet know, you see the yada here, did not yet know the Lord. I don't, it, it's incorrect here to say or to think that Samuel was an unbeliever, that he didn't have faith yet. Uh, the text doesn't indicate that at all. In fact, the second part of the text really should say, instead of, and, instead of following with and, the word of the Lord had not yet come to him. Or the idea really should be because. What it's really saying is that Samuel is not, a, uh, he's not an unbeliever. He's not ignorant or something like that. Rather, it indicates that God has not yet revealed his word to Samuel. He hasn't yet been called into the prophetic office. So all of this is kind of... Uh, by not he, 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 it's kind of excusable that he's not quite aware of what's going on because he's not yet, he's young, he hasn't yet been called into the prophetic office, but this is what's happening now. So the word of the Lord had not, he did not yet know the Lord in that sense. Not, not in, uh, and we need to point that out because it's easy to confuse that with the yada, because yada can be a very covenantal knowing, a relationship knowing but let's let's be careful not to overemphasize and say, yeah, yeah, that Samuel, he wasn't a he wasn't a a member of the covenant yet. No, we know that's not true because all that had to take place in order for him to become an apprentice in the priesthood. I mean, that seems somewhat obvious, actually. So, so don't take that too far 
when you read that. Going on then to, um, we're going to just jump down. If you want to scroll down to um, all the rest of the text here to verse 10. We're going to pop over to uh, up to verse 10 then, or down to verse 10 rather. And because uh, all these are kind of a, a repetition here, you know, the three times. And so here we have this really cool uh, word. I suppose I should pronounce it if I can. Wa-yith-yatsav. Wa-yith-yatsav. wa yith I'm sure the Hebrew scholars in the audience will say, missed it by that much. But it's, it's an interesting word. It's a hitpayel, and it's from this root, yitzav. That doesn't work with that. <laughs> the yitzav, the hitpayel, to, to take a stand or take one stand, to station oneself. So uh, basically, the Lord God has come out of the Holy of Holies and stations himself, stands there. Whether he is a visible presence or not, the idea is that he has stationed himself and, and talks to Samuel. And we don't get any idea that this is a visible presence. Uh, presence at all, our manifestation, but the whole manifestation is through his word. But still we have this, this language of he has come out, he has stationed himself and called and called out to, um, to uh, Samuel. And Samuel, of course, listening to what he was told by Eli now, he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, it's also important to see this, this has kind of taken a very uh, a servant-like attitude a humble attitude, uh, subservient, you know, that you can imagine Samuel is not like, we'll consider him to be kind of on his probably face down, bowing before the Holy of Holies and, and uh, responding in that way. It's not, not, uh, not to be thought of, of in a casual manner, I guess we would say, but a very humble attitude, using the term servant, the avad, all that sort of thing. That makes, that gives that kind of sense. So that's, that's our basic text for today. There's a lot of things going on. This is a very pivotal moment for Samuel, not only his birth, but then coming into the prophetic, being called or sent into the prophetic office and what that's all going to mean, because this is a very transitional time from the book or from the time of the judges over into the United Monarchy, a lot of things are going on. And so as we go through the, uh, the two books of Samuel, we'll note there's, a, there's the history here and the importance of that history to Israel and to their future. And of course, the messianic realities of it all are very big, very big. God bless you preaching this week. Uh, preach on that Old Testament. Do it. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you.